perhaps giveaways to give out before we get started. Uh, first things first, um, after the talk, uh, we are slowly selling out of t-shirts and registration, or excuse me, uh, giving away t-shirts for donations. They're not actually for sale. Uh, $15 for the shirts for this, uh, this year in registration. There's a whole bunch of uh, really nice shirts there sized in, you know, from a poor college student to uh, fat hackers like me. Uh, and there's also women's sizes as well. So again, that's in registration. If you are coming to our uh, gathering this evening, uh, you can get a go to registration again, get your wristband, get directions to where the, the party is going to be at. Uh, after the talk, every presentation, uh, one of the best things about that we try and enforce, uh, provide to each of the speakers is feedback. What you thought of their presentation needs work and what you thought of their presentation that was really good, what you, what you learned and how they helped you. So if you could go to feedback.schmoocon.org and please provide feedback to the, each of the speakers. It's, uh, not only do we try and you know, pick talks that we think are interesting and we'll you know, maybe teach some, some stuff, we want to also help the, the speakers out too. So please do that after uh, every presentation. Um, so I've been doing this every, uh, every day. I'm going to continue doing this for every talk. Valentine's Day was two days ago. How many of you booked your travel for ShmooCon and forgot that it was Valentine's Day? So perhaps for your, for your significant other that was uh, negatively impacted. So who flew in the farthest? So where you flew in from? Honol oh, all right, uh, you immediately win. So I have a, neck, uh, a moose neck brace. So on your flight back, you can fall asleep, uh, asleep with a moose wrapped around your neck. a moose-branded travel buddy. Security universities uh, given us a whole number, uh, number of t-shirts to give out. Uh, again, these are in, sized in uh, poor college student, not old fat hacker, so. <laughs> All right, and we have a, a few more giveaways. So a ShmooCon water bottle. So with all the alcohol that you're going to be drinking tonight, actually put water in it. So it's not really sharp, but watch out. As he chucks it. Oh. <laughs> good, good catch. And I'm not going to throw this. Wait, so you threw, you threw the hard thing, and now you're not going to throw the soft thing. No, I'm not going to throw the soft thing. Because yeah, I'd rather not people fight over it. So. Um, Carson's going to be talking about the 10 strategies for a world-class uh, C-cert. Yeah. Uh, what is the one thing that you shouldn't do when building a C-cert? Uh, uh, the best one will get the prize. Oh, come on, I can talk about it. Hire Carson. There you go, that'll win. All right, uh, come up and you can have a nice laptop bag. You're good. All right, uh, again, uh, welcome back to, Sh to ShmooCon 2013. Uh, please give a warm welcome to somebody I've worked with for a long, well, worked with a long time ago, yes. uh, Carson. Word. Good luck. Uh, ten strategies of world-class uh, cert. How's it going? So I'm going to talk about a, a topic that's near and dear uh, to my heart today. It's called computer network defense. Um, so where are we, right? Um, we have a virtual sea of alerts, logs, and cyber intel. Um, we have a, a IT workforce that hopefully is skilled. Um, and we have a mess of technology, some of which were talked about at the con here, um, that can support what I would characterize as a competent defense of the enterprise. Yet we are failing, right? We've got all this awareness about cyber. This has been a big change. Um, Bruce talked about this yesterday. So usually it's the CIO calling us, not us calling the CIO, right? They're like, oh my god, we're being hacked. No, no, it's okay. It's cool. We'll call you when something bad is happening. So why are we struggling? Well, there's a lot of reasons why, and, and so many talks here talk about that, but I would argue that um, in some regards, we're our wor own worst enemy. We are not doing defense right, and it's not for technological reasons. 
So today I wanted to talk about, um, what I, as I see it, what are some, some strategies of a world-class computer security incident response team. Um, and I'm going to talk about issues that cross-cut people, process, and technology. So the scope here specifically, you know, we're talking about computer network defense. Some people call it uh, defensive cyber operations, whatever. Um, there are organizations usually known as a, a CSERT or a SOC or all these other terms I have up on this slide. So let's get right to it. The first strategy, put c and in one shop. Don't fragment. Now, what am I talking about here? There's, there's five pieces to it. The first, real-time monitoring and triage. So those are usually your, your tier one people, usually the people, if you have 24 by 7 ops, they are usually there, um, you know, 24 hours a day. The second piece, the folks who are doing your in-depth analysis and response, so that's tier two and above, you know, your malware analysis, so on and so forth. Your third area, people who are doing cyber intel collection and analysis, possibly some training to go along with that. Your fourth, the people who maintain your CSERT tools. Now I'm talking about, I'm not talking about all IT here, I'm just talking about sensors, you know, the stuff that supports directly what this shop is doing. And the fifth are the people who engineer those capabilities. Um, time and again, we, it's, we've proven that in order to actually have all these, these parts function in a manner that keeps pace with the adversary, you got to ha close that, that decision cycle, right? We're not talking about months or years. We're talking about minutes and hours, right? I need to be able to turn my signatures around quickly. You can't do that if you fragment. Um, there's all kinds of bad things that happen. Um, if you don't do this. So I'll simply say that if you bring all this stuff together, you're going to synchronize your ops tempo pretty well, hopefully. Second strategy. You need some authority. You know, you find bad stuff. Uh, hey guys, something bad happened. Maybe we need to go do something about that. Hopefully this, you have some teeth, right? So let's talk about some of the authorities. Now some of these could be inherited or they can be actually written down on paper. The first one, be the one and usually, not always, but usually the only organization for your given constituency that has the job of doing C and D. The second, you want to be the decision authority, at least in part, for response. Okay, so being able to go say, go block that stuff, go redirect things, et cetera, when it's appropriate. Now, blocking, I'm going to talk about this later, but just, you know, knee-jerk reaction, block something, not always the best approach. The third, you need to at least be a participant in actions that can potentially prevent incidents. All right, so hey, you know, that patch came out, go deploy the patch, um, go, you know, put up a firewall block before you get totally pwns -ored. Well, you probably are, but that's another story. Fourth, um, you should be able to communicate directly with the people who are stakeholders in this. So we're talking about everybody from the head of your, uh, your company, your agency, uh, your whatever you work for, right? You need to be able to talk to them all, all the way down. Law enforcement, um, sometimes if you may have a role talking to, um, you know, industry um, or the press, right? Having to ask permission to go talk to a CISO, not a good scene. Fifth item, you should be able to acquire, deploy, and operate your own freaking tools. I have not, how many times have I talked to organizations who are like, oh yeah, we'd love to deploy that, that's, um, that signature, but we can't. Fail. And the six, you should be able to um, collect and retain whatever information you need to include full PCAP data, log data, etc. Now, I make all these recommendations with the following qualifier. You need to be able to wield these authorities with great care towards your mission, your business, whatever it is your constituency is in, in the business, government, industry, or what have you. Um, so you go and you say, oh my God, we've got to turn off all these computers in response to this incident. Uh, be careful when you do that because you could backfire if you're not right. Third strategy, and this is actually probably the most controversial and uh, the one I suspect I'll get the most questions about. So you have two competing needs when you're doing C and D. The first is the following. You want to be big. You want to be big enough to have all the authorities you need and all the people, the, the cadre of C&D specialists to actually do your mission. 
and you usually can't do that when you have a very small constituency, like when the, the thousands are maybe at 10,000 assets. On the other hand, you want to be small because you want to be able to as, clo as close to the edge as you can. You want to be able to understand those end assets and networks. The further away from them that you are, the poorer your understanding is to un your understanding of them is. All right, so you've got to strike a balance. Now, for a lot of organizations that I run into, that means you're talking about tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of assets, but generally not more than that. So the question today, especially in government, is if I have a constituency of, say, 10 million or more hosts, and I'm a big, you know, national level CSERT, how do I function appropriately? How do I actually help the organizations beneath me function in a harmonious and effective manner without getting in their way? Right there, we haven't come to a decision on this yet. This is a, this is a source of great deal of conflict. What I would argue is that those big C certs are in a position to do things that the little guys can't, like collecting large amounts of cyber intel and redistributing it in a timely manner, um, doing things like forensics and malware analysis as a service. You know, these are useful things. A lot of the small guys can't staff what the big ones can. Likewise, what they should not be in the business of doing, in my personal opinion, is analyzing large amounts of raw data. They're too far away from the end assets to understand what they're looking at. Fourth, there are all these things that you could potentially be doing. And a lot of C certs end up getting in the, the rhythm of trying to please everyone all the time. Well, we all know you can't do that. So what I would argue is a more effective strategy, if you can, is try to exercise some kind of control over what you choose to offer your constituents. Choose amongst all the potential services um, that you have to offer. One of the, what are the things you can afford to do and do well? Fifth, this is a big one. I'd love to be able to hire a CSERT with people who go to ShmooCon, right? But I can't necessarily do that. I will say this, and there, one of the things I realized in the last uh, couple years of doing C&D is that one really good analyst with some pretty good tools, or maybe even great tools, is vastly more effective than a hundred poor analysts with even all right tools. Time and again, the amount of alerts you're processing, the amount of cyber intel you're processing is huge. Being able to introduce some automation in terms of your analytics, um, your detection, and some of your triage is critical if you're ever going to cut through this. So how do we hire those people is, is actually a big difficulty, you know. Cyber is exploding, everybody wants the right people, and you generally don't have a lot of money to pay them. So here's a couple thoughts. First of all, we want to be able to vet our employee effectively and check ride them. So even once you bring them in the door after, you know, you've done your interviews and whatnot, if they don't cut it, get rid of them. So there's some background to this. Um, perhaps the most important is the passion for the job, right? You're not just here to collect a paycheck, you're here to defend the enterprise. The second, provide them opportunities for continual improvement. Um, being able to do on-the-job training, vendor training, etc. And the third, pay them. I don't think I need to explore that one further. Number six, realize the potential of your investments. How many of us have gotten involved in the mindset of, ooh, shiny, I've got more IOPS and gigs and terabytes and megahertz and gigahertz than you do? Bwah! I recommend pick a core set of um, technologies, stick with them. I recognize that CSERTs, you know, you're going to have a mess of different technologies, especially open source tools, that you're going to need to get the job done every day. But there's probably a small set of capabilities you need to run your shop that cost a lot of money. SIM tools are a very good example. Mass PCAP collection and alerting is another, all right? So many times I see organizations, they'll buy these tools and they'll use 10% of their capabilities. Three years later when their maintenance is up, they're like, oh, this isn't working for us, we're going to buy something else. No, dumbass, you didn't use what you bought. Not only that, so once you buy a tool, use it to the maximum extent you can. And once you've recognized the fact that you've reached the limitations of tools, then maybe you should think about buying something else. 
I should also mention, make sure you engineer to your operator's requirements, right? Again, this goes back to bring your engineering into the same shop that's doing ops. You will reap the rewards, I promise you. Number seven, don't collect everything. I've seen people interpret audit rules, say, oh, we need to collect every file, read and write on every system in the enterprise. Fail. All right, so the C-cert is usually in a good position to actually in introduce some sanity into this equation. So let's talk about this. On the right hand of this graph, excuse me, let's start on the left hand side. So on the left hand side, let's say you have some really awesome tools that collect lots of data. You know, I'm not gonna mention product names, but there's big sim and lo log collection products out there that are really good at this. You don't bring the right tool data into them, you know, just one or two feeds, you know, 100,000 events per day, maybe a million events per day, you're not meeting what they're capable of. On the other end, you have people who are like, ZOMG, we need to collect everything. And you're on the right hand side. You're totally overwhelmed and the signal is lost in the noise. So you wanna strike a balance between those, um, those two sides and hopefully you're in a position um, where you have reached the peak capabilities of your tool. In other words, balance the amount of data with the quality of your data. Right, and you wanna cover, so there's a couple of things to think about here. Number one, you wanna kill, cover as much of the cyber kill chain as possible. Um, you do not wanna start your analysts, especially your tier one folks, with a raw feed of everything. I've seen people light up a SIM console. They're like, yeah, we're gonna show them 24 hours of events of everything. You want people to leave, that's the way to do it. And over, think about where do you want your overlapping capabilities. If I have a very specific brand of TTPs, techniques, uh, somebody, what does the TTP stand for? Thank you. Right, so you wanna, you have some really critical TTPs, you wanna think about maybe having overlapping capabilities there in terms of the areas of your kill chain, in terms of your hosts, in terms of, your, in terms of what you're looking at. Number eight, protect your mission. The whole notion of having a CSERT is predicated on the idea that we're gonna get owned at some point, right? So we wanna be able to operate our defensive capabilities through those intrusions. All right, so there's some basics here. Number one, don't, don't combine your monitoring infrastructure with your general constituency Windows domain, right? Your domain gets rooted, you're rooted, goodbye. That goes along with don't put your incident details and emails to the CISO that are unencrypted, or right, even if they are encrypted, you're still probably in trouble. All right, so we're talking about, in, in some areas, you might hear the term sources and methods, it applies here, protect them at all costs. Understand the following, if you want to breed acceptance and understanding of what you as a CSERT are doing, there are some things you're going to need to reveal to your constituency, right? Don't, you know, think about having that mission brief that talks about some of your secret sauce, but not the things you're really worried about, or the things that are absolutely critical. Like, don't tell them where your sensors are, duh. Don't tell them exactly what signatures you're running, but tell them about some of the successes you've had. These kinds of things breed trust, and you need it. If you're, if you're gonna have them do what you want when you call them. So in this diagram here, I've showed a couple different features of what a CSERT um, architecture might look like. Very, very high level. Let me go over some of them. Number one, hopefully your analysts and your aggregation systems are sitting in an enclave that you manage and that no one else has access to in the constituency. And I don't mean general IT. I mean just the CSERT and no one else and that you're probably going to have a series of sensors of some sort, be it host-based or network-based, at remote locations. Um, sometimes you're gonna have to work within the native capabilities of say your, your commercial applications that do that. Sometimes if you're using open source tools, because we're all a fan of those, right? Um, you have other options for um, encrypting both your alerts and your command and control of your assets. Not only that, you wanna make sure that where you're monitoring um, is completely invisible to the adversary. You know, no IP, no MAC address, no nothing. Um, think about uh, receive only cables, those kinds of things. Number nine, I'm not gonna steal too much of the, uh, the thunder of the folks tomorrow on the panel, but let me go over a few basics here. 
the adversary has so many advantages at their disposal. One of the, one of the things that we can do here is unite the capabilities of the defenders. And I don't just mean in your constituency, I mean of, your, of people who do what you do. All right, so if you're in a particular area of industry, consider reaching out to other CSERTs that are in your same general line of business. Government, education, et cetera, you get the idea. Right, cyber SA is as much about looking out as it is looking in. I've seen a lot of shops actually put a, pr a pretty good cyber SA capability with almost no understanding of their own network. Their mere ability to understand what the adversary is doing in great detail immediately made them um, experts on what was going on. Um, so when we talk about collaborating with other CSERTs, it's very important to make sure that you don't have the adversary in your collaboration forums, right? So establishing those relationships face to face um, and making sure you know who are part of the forums and that it's analyst to analyst, right? So what we don't want is the following. Some CISO or CIO, God love them, they pay the bills, but they don't necessarily need to see the chatter between analysts talking about, hey, I think I saw this, that, or the other thing. Because what are they going to do? They're going to be like, ZOMG, we got owned. Not necessarily follow the escalation paths, right? You've got to foster that direct analyst-to-analyst -analyst communication with those raw bona fides, right? PCAP, images, et cetera. But it doesn't necessarily need to be incident-focused. And this is where a lot of people run into trouble right now. Um, we're a lot of work is being done right now on how do we support this kind of collaboration um, without revealing that you um, actually got hacked, right? So how do you share those indicators effectively? Um, so you want to share all this stuff as much as possible. Um, it can save you years and years worth of work. I've seen organizations um, blow through piles and piles of cyber intel reporting, right, from the internet, build these huge ind indicators list, and then share them with um, their partner CSERTs. It saved them years of effort. This is a huge win if you can do it. Um, so chances are, as a CSERT, you feel like the ugly duckling compared to almost anyone else in your constituency. You're probably one of the few organizations that do something related to computer network defense, and you're like, oh, nobody loves this, right? Because you're always bringing bad news. So when you do these kinds of things, when you reach out to these other organizations, you build a sense of community, which can really help your analysts, I don't know, not quit. The 10th, oh, this is my favorite. Dude, senior visibility, not a challenge. What does an EMT do when they show up to the scene of, a, of an accident? They run in with their hair on fire? No. They calm everybody down, right? That's your job. Don't jump to conclusions. If you think some, some system has been owned, you can't just go in and be like, OMG, we need to turn it off, OK? Talk to the system owners. Understand what the impact is going to be. And a lot of times, you've got to say it in business um, in business speak, not just bits and bytes. The second, this is a real fun one, provide measured updates at measured times. So if any of you have ever had a loved one in the hospital, right, if they're being operated on, are you going to go in there, you're going to act the doc doctor every 10 minutes, hey, how's it going? No, because that's going to prevent them from getting their job done. It's the same thing here. If you are being asked by your constituency seniors every day or perhaps multiple times a day for updates on the incidents, that can impact your ability to actually process what is going on with your incident. Because you're not always going to know what's going to happen as soon as you find it. In fact, you almost you never do, right? So you've got to let your, give your analysts the ability to continue analyzing. Blocking is not always the best thing to do. We've been realizing this much more and more and more. Watch your adversary. What are they interested in? What are their TTPs? What are they after? Where are they in your network? You go reformat, reinstall. The first time you think you see an incident, congratulations, you now have no idea what other hosts were connected to that in absence of other data. So sometimes you've got to think real hard about when do you want to pull the plug. So my message is this. When we talk about how do we do network defense effectively, there's three things to consider. People, process, right, and technology. There's all the issues we're talking about here across all three areas. 
So to this end, um, I've done the following. I've written a book that actually back up these slides. I'm giving it away for free. Um, it's entering the public release process through my company, MITRE, um, and I'm happy to give it to any of you if you're interested in, um, once it's done. Because I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make any money on this, so I just figure, why, why the hell not, right? So if you want to email me, it's Carson at mitre.org, not .com, .org. Questions. So that's a great, so the question was um, what I consider consolidating a management of my perimeter control devices such as my firewalls and my proxies under the shop. My answer would be it depends. I've seen this done. Um, there are definitely an ad advantages. So I will say this. Whenever the CSERT in get <coughs> excuse me, gets involved in any effort where they're managing any kind of inline device, be it on the host or on the network, they immediately become blamed for everything. Hey, the network is slow. Oh, it's a C cert again. Stupid security, right? So, yep, yep. Especially on the host. Oh my God, our printers aren't working. It's your hips again. <laughs> Except that's true. <sighs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, management of, of perimeter devices is actually one of the potential um, capabilities a C cert could take on. But it can really balloon um, your staffing. Um, and it can distract you potentially if you if you don't structure your ops right. Great question. Any other questions? You talked a lot about size being important. Yes. When does size become a problem? That's a really good question. So there's a couple things that come to mind. One of them is um, are you able to respond in a timely manner and in an accurate manner, right? So if one of my, if it, is what I'm doing actually countering the threat? And if you're not close enough to your assets, chances are that's not going to be very good. But if you're too small in size, chances are you don't have a large enough staff that can maintain all those schools to understand their adversary. So it's a big balancing act. And for everybody, it's different. I've seen organizations that uh, have a constituency of 5,000 users or IPs that function very well. I've seen organizations that have hundreds of thousands and they function very well. Um, in some cases you can tier your capability. So like let's say you have several hundred thousand users or assets and you're at many different sites. I, I, I yeah. Right. No, no, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm getting to that. So, like, if you have a lot of sites and you have a lar large number of users in your enterprise, one of the things you could potentially do is have, like, a mini C-cert at some of your major data centers or sites. Like, let's say you have an, a branch office, say, that's 5,000 people. Having some people on the ground there might not be a bad idea, but you have to be able to um, put together an architecture that brings th them into the fold. Right. You don't want them to totally go native and go off and do stuff, and you don't want them um, to not understand how your tools architecture is put together and how you're best leveraging your monitoring capabilities. So I've seen numbers, and again, it's different for everybody. Um, I, could I could probably put together a whole talk on how do you know how many people you need for your CSERT, but I've seen organizations that have a handful of folks. I've seen organizations that have 100 or more. Um, let me go over here before I get back to you. Yep. How do you get, I'm sorry, repeat the question? Ah, okay. So the question was, is how do you avoid being pigeonholed, being recognized just as the admins um, for these capabilities? Um, so I think one of the things that, come, that comes to mind is um, bringing situational awareness to your seniors on some kind of proactive basis, um, specifically with regards to not just what tools you're operating, but um, what incidents have you helped prevent and what did that mean to the bottom line?
Ah, okay, so that's a really good question. So the question was, is do I prefer a, a regimented tiered structure where, you know, the tier one only does blinky lights and the tiers two plus um, have a much longer window, and, or do I, do I favor a method where I, I think uh, doing free form is better? Um, so I would say do what works for you. I prefer a tiered structure, and one, here's one reason why. If your tier one people are allowed to spend more than, say, several minutes or close to an hour on incident, what have they uh, missed in the meantime? Right, so you've got to make sure that that ops window, that, that time window they're allowed to look at a given alert or set of alerts is um, small enough that they don't, a bunch of other stuff doesn't scroll by in the meantime. Um, the other thing I would mention is that the, the, the con ops I'm used to is where you, if you have people in tier one who demonstrate a lot of out of the box thinking, generally you're going to promote them, right? And that's all about being able to retain your employees effectively. Other questions? Go ahead. Yes. Can you come up with any examples of or of large organizations that can do some of those services we're talking about about overall threat analysis and malware analysis as a service to smaller constituencies underneath them that been able to effectively give those services? So I don't work for any of them, so I can't really attest to it. So you're looking you're looking for positive examples. So I don't personally, but I think there's some probably some other some folks in this room who do. The defense industrial base that tries to do that. Yeah. There's phases and phases of phishing. So the gentleman gentleman in front uh, row here mentioned that there's a defense industrial base um, scenario where they share information that seems to be pretty successful. Again, I see a lot of value in peered relationships. Those are, the, those are the kinds of scenarios I've seen work really well because you see each other as equal and you don't have any thousand mile screwdrivers, if that makes any sense. Other questions? I could be here all day. Way in the back. Yes. Okay, so the question is, is how do I how do I keep tier one from fleeing? How do I how do I reduce the monotony? Um, I can think of a couple things. Um, the first is um, cross training and rotating through functions. So there isn't necessarily just one tier one job. Um, for instance, uh, there are some people who could potentially um, rotate in and out of routine network scanning. I don't mean pen testing, I don't mean vulnerability assessment. I mean like, hey, I'm going to go run my net nesses on my network every week or something, right? Um, there are other roles that are involved in collection and at least initial analysis of all the cyber news and cyber intel out on the internet. All right. Um, they're also different within your monitoring systems. Chances are, at least hopefully, they're looking at more than just one console or they're looking at, like within a given SIM system, they're looking at more than just one use case. So rotating them through, say, uh, which uh, data they're uh, supposed to look at every day will help. Does that answer your question? Super. Other questions? Okay, I think we're done. Thank you for your time.